But since the Paris Agreement in 2015, what has the world really achieved in its fight against climate change? And why are scientists pressing for urgent action? Our next report tries to find out. The 12th of December, 2015, Paris. The day when almost 200 nations joined hands to combat climate change. The world agreed to control the rise in global temperature to below 2 degrees Celsius in this century, while making more efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. It also established commitments by all parties to maintain a national determined goal. The pact, which becomes operational in 2020, called upon developed nations to mobilize 100 billion U.S. dollars every year in climate financing for developing countries. Three years on, the intent displayed in Paris hasn't transformed into concrete actions. A United Nations report has found that the world has not done enough to cut greenhouse gas emissions. So we're getting out. Though the U.S. has pulled out of the agreement, many other nations, too, are off track to meet their Paris promises. The list includes the entire European Union, Argentina, Australia, Canada, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and South Korea. But there are others who are keeping their word. China, Japan, and Brazil have met their targets, while Russia, India, and Turkey are on course to exceed the Paris commitments. But environmentalists say the response has been inadequate. The UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, released in October, warned that the world has just 12 more years to cut emissions by over 40 percent to meet a 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. And governments are not even remotely close to meeting that target. According to the Climate Action Tracker, even if all nations adhere to admission cut promises made in the French capital, our planet would still warm by almost 3 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. If countries do not act, the global temperatures are expected to rise by 4 to 5 degrees Celsius. And these predictions are not theoretical. The change is already visible. According to the World Meteorological Organization, the global average temperature for the first 10 months of this year was almost 1 degree Celsius above the levels between 1850 and 1900. 2018 is on course to be the fourth warmest year on record, and the last four years were the world's hottest on record. The 20 warmest years were in the past 22 years. The climate clock is ticking. Commitments won't be enough to save the planet. With Nyan Seth, Christy Skull for CGTN. Well, for more on this, we're now joined by Ms. Wu Changhua, Executive Director of the Professional Association for China Environment. Thank you very much for uh, joining us in Global Watch. Uh, Ms. Wu, well, it seems that uh, the countries uh, are facing increasing difficulties in implementing the Paris Climate Accord, indeed. Why do you think that is the reason? Why no substantial or pragmatic a pragmatic actions are being taken to contain the disaster of climate change. Is it uh, having anything to do with the withdrawal of the U.S. not long ago? Or uh, I think it's, it's a complicated uh, question. And uh, the withdrawal of the U.S. from the Paris, from the global climate change process, definitely uh, give a negative blow to the international process from the momentum and from the sense of urgency. But in a broad sense, actually, the rest of the international community hasn't really withdrawn yet. Mm. And uh, meaning, you know, if you look at China, EU, many other countries are all sort of honoring their commitment to the Paris Accord. and. Uh, pretty much implementing what they said they, want, they, they plan to do and uh, pretty much on the track. Mm -hmm. The challenge is uh, today uh, there are many other priorities, uh, growth, jobs. Mm -hmm. If you look at the re re recent repercussions mm -hmm. of the trade wars between the two largest economies, what does that mean to many other economies? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at other geopolitical, mm -hmm. geoeconomic chaos, mm -hmm. I think they're all distracting uh, the attention from mm -hmm. the global climate change process. Mm -hmm. But there is a positive side. Mm -hmm. In reality, if you look at China, EU, and many other uh, countries, we are pretty much on the track. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, the, the growth of renewable energy, if you look at the investment in energy efficiency, uh, we have to admit, actually, and uh, we are pretty much achieving mm. uh, towards where we want it to be. Mm. The biggest gap is whatever we said we're going to do or what we have achieved and the ideal situation or what the scenario, what scientists are telling us, the gap is huge, and mm. that's where we need to step up the effort. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, that uh, any, any other kind of uh, conventions or collaborations among the world uh, uh, Country, the countries in the world can actually 
filling that gap or at least narrow that gap? For instance, uh, how can COP24 happen in Poland help? Uh, I think the agenda set for uh, this uh, current uh, COP24 in Poland is very clear. I think it, particularly to address one issue, is, which is about uh, the rule of the book. Mm. Uh, if you look at the Paris Accord, uh, in the basket actually, all the countries submitted uh, their commitments and uh, sort of voluntarily. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in that context. If you look at the, ba in the basket actually, the timeline, the commitments, the narratives, description, it's not very consistent. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult, actually, at the international process mm -hmm. to understand the shape, you know, the mm -hmm. consistency, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so for this COP24, pretty much said that as a top priority. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the negoti negotiation process mm -hmm. in, you know, during the year time, and I'm very hopeful that, mm -hmm. uh, and optimistic as well, I think agreement will be achieved, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rules mm -hmm. and uh, how, do, how we define the shape of mm -hmm. the implementation of the mm -hmm. Paris Accord. Mm -hmm. And there are some deeper issues about the mechanisms to those instruments, I think that's definitely going to be achieved. Mm. Well, very frank question, um, Ms. Wu. As a uh, uh, environmentalist, uh, as, a, uh, as a, an expert on the environmental protection, at least, what's your personal assessment of the current progress made in terms of countering climate change by, by the world, by any kind of uh, world organizations like COP24, like uh, the Paris Agreement? Uh, it's limited to progress, but there is progress. And the, the UN process is necessary uh, because without it, actually, there's no such a mechanism platform, actually, for global community to work together. So that's a very important piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, which is carry on. So COP4 carries on. There will be COP25 and, you know, more to come. Uh, but we all know it's not adequate. Uh, we mm -hmm. cannot just rely on international negotiation to really address the real-life challenges, you know, climate change. Uh, what's encouraging at this moment, uh, large economies like China, EU, and some others, are pretty much treating this issue not only as an obligation, but really as an opportunity to transform our energy, our economy, our industry, including infrastructure as well, particularly powered by the development of new technologies. Mm -hmm. Now we live in a period of the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, you know, digital technologies, blockchain, uh, AI, machine learning, you know, 3D printing, advanced manufacturing, and many others, material science, biological sciences. So from technology perspective, we are empowered the, the, you know, the best ever in history to, for us to address global challenges like climate change. Mm. So besides obligations, uh, of course, you know, we have to take on our you know, responsibilities. Mm. But more importantly, large economies look at the G20. Mm. G20's economy coming together accounts about more than 80 percent of the global GDP. Mm. If G20, the largest economies coming together to take transformative actions, we pretty much know, actually, the world mm. will be transformed. Mm. And that's where I think the sense of urgency, that's where the leadership is urgently required. You mentioned a lot of efforts um, that China has been making in terms of environmental protection and countering climate change, indeed. But you also mentioned the priorities that uh, uh, the developing countries are now having, for instance, development, economic, uh, economy, etc., etc. So, with challenges and efforts being side by side, how much progress can a country like China be making? One point I want to add is not developing countries are facing challenges today. Developed mm -hmm. countries also face challenges. Mm -hmm. And one, the biggest developed countries has withdrawn it already. That's mm -hmm. true, already. Uh, I have to say I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful in a way, as I said, technologies are already, already available. There will be more technologies coming on board. And the awareness of the desire, aspiration from the society. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at China, we live in Beijing. People want to address air pollution mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. you know, pollution issues and other pollution, you know, contamination yes. issues there. And and uh, very importantly, uh, there is a competitiveness issue, mm -hmm. uh, meaning China, as the world's largest uh, mm -hmm. developing country, mm -hmm. the, the second largest economy, yes. needs to develop, needs to figure out actually how to find an alternative pathway uh, for future development model. That sort of uh, momentum or drive, driving mm -hmm. force is very critical, meaning China wants to lead the world to shift towards a sustainable future. Momentum is there for sure, but there has been debates about how to implement environmental environmental protection in China. Is this, 
sh should it be something different from implementing that from in other countries, for instance? There are deeper issues, even for China. I think you know, if you look at the institutional governance issues, there there are some deep reform mm -hmm. uh, that are urgently needed. Uh, if you look at the buildings, transportation, power industries, we all have policies or, or targets around renewable energy, around energy efficiency, but somehow we know and those things, sectors do not work separately. They are pretty much integrated together. So there's deeper issues about how do you make sure the policy incentives would incentivize integrative design to capture the potential in an integrated manner. And of course, there, there is capability capacity issue, particularly for many other developing countries. That is why the international process is necessary to facilitate actually resources and support from developed countries to other developing countries. And this is where we stand today. Fundamentally, there is a word today, acceleration. Mm -hmm. As I said, we have technologies, we have aspiration, desire. We pretty much know what to do today, mm -hmm. but how do we make sure we accelerate the process mm -hmm. and the global community really coming together to address mm -hmm. this global climate challenges there? Mm -hmm. That is where we stand today. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wu Changhua, Executive Director of the Professional Association for China's Environment. Thank you very much for your input.